You are welcome to my channel. Thanks for visiting. Please remember to subscribe if you haven't. But if you subscribe before and you're visiting again, I'm saying a big thank you. Kindly remember to share this on your various platforms. Today, without wasting any time at all, I'll be going straight to methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. There, we're going to cover the history of how we arrive at methicillin resistant strains. Also, how can we make the diagnosis? Do we have different types? Okay, then what are the preventive measures? Let's go. Methicillin resistance to Staphylococcus aureus is not a local problem, it is a worldwide problem. How did we get here? Well, we have a long history. Methicillin was introduced in the late 50s. Some literature put it as early 60s, but specifically, it was introduced by Beecher in 1959. Since 1960, and precisely in 1961, the first case of methicillin resistance to Staphylococcus aureus was reported. MRSA could be found in hospitals. In fact, a group would bear that name and also in the long-term care facilities or in the community, and that will form the name of another group. Like I said just a while ago, it's a worldwide or pandemic problem. There are six major MRSA clones already identified. I'm not saying the only clones identified, but six major ones. Like in community MRSA, 97% will be attributed to this, type 4. While 3% of community MRSA will be attributed to type 5. The impact. As a matter of fact, I've decided to have this presentation because of this. MRSA will lead to huge mortality. It has caused you know, so many lives in the past. Although it's getting better now, We'll know why in a bit. There'll be huge productivity loss, and you know why. Of course, when there is decreased production, no, there'll be loss of money. Ironically, money is actually required to deal with this situation. Longer hospital bed occupation will be the, the case with so many people with MRSA. Unfortunately, this very factor could lead to acquisition of the hospital acquired MRSA. Now the full history. Credit should be given to Alexandra Fleming, who discovered penicillin in 1928 in London, United Kingdom, specifically at St. Mary's Hospital, Northwest London, England. All antibiotics will work through one of the following mechanisms. It is either they are going to work against the synthesis of certain items in the bacteria like the cell wall, protein, or nucleic acid, or they are going to disrupt the already formed structures like cell membrane destruction or you no know, anti-metabolic activities. Still on history, they discover penicillin by Alexander Fleming will help in killing bacteria. And that will be done by Victor Lactam ring that will bind to penicillin sensitive enzymes like transpeptidase, carboxypeptidase, and that will be done irreversibly. Peptidoglycan which is a three-dimensional structure of the rigid bacterial cell wall synthesis, will be inhibited. The cross-linking activity will be prevented. Hence, there will be no new cell wall formation. This is the way that penicillin no worked in the past, clean, and still doing the same today, if it is not no penicillin resistant. The bacteria is then open to the environment. 
open to water, open to you know, forces around, and also cytoplasmic content will leak out. It's like you're in a house, tornado has just you know struck, and then the walls of the house all taken off, then you are open to the flood and anything that could get into your territory. The same thing is happening to the bacteria here. The cell wall is no longer there. They have to glycine, no synthesis is inhibited, no more cross-linking. Then the bacteria will die. The defense mechanism against penicillin beta lactam ring is the production of beta lactamase enzymes. You know what? The bacteria now then felt that we can fold our arms and the human beings will keep sending the penicillin to destroy us this way, then they build you know, the wall of resistance. The enzymes here will break the beta lactam ring. Wow. Can't you see that? Remember, the penicillin is acting through this beta lactam ring. So the bacteria develop beta lactam enzymes to work against the beta lactam ring. And how would they do that? They would do that by hydrolyzing the peptide bond and render the penicillin ineffective. It can be said that resistance to penicillin started this way. Now, penicillinase is the first beta lactamase ever identified, and that was identified in 1940. Briefly, what is penicillinase all about? That is the name given to the enzyme, and it is being given that name. Remember, enzymes mostly will take the name of the substrate they act upon, right? So it's been named after penicillin, probably because the bacteria produce the enzyme to inactivate penicillin, okay? So this could rightly be posed as war between bacteria and human beings in antibiotic world because bacteria seems to be building a fence against you know, the enemy, the beta lactam ring from penicillin. Human beings actually produce a purified form of penicillin. What for? To treat reactions you no, know, due to penicillin. And the big question is, why are we not having it today to deal with penicillin reactions or hypersensitivity to penicillin. Well, it's not that very common. Um, I have never used it, but so many other doctors, they've used it across the globe, but not that very common. It's being given intramuscularly, not given intravenously, no IV administration. So it's not gaining so much popularity per se. Okay, there's a problem, right? The penicillin is now you know, struggling to deal with bacteria because big lactamases are already being produced by bacteria. So the scientists started working, the pharmacology started working, how can we get an agent that would deal with beta lactamases. Then they started working on production of the following antibiotics. Now, medicine. You've seen the journey how we arrive at methicillin. Methicillin is also called this, it's also methicillin, it depends on the spelling, right? It is an antibiotic, of course, but it's a semi-synthetic derivative of penicillin. It has a narrow spectrum against beta lactamase producing staphylococcus. The necessity to get rid of the strains of gram-positive bacteria that are penicillinase producing, for example, staphylococcus aureus, and the resistance to most penicillin led to the production of methicillin. So the people that 
brought methicillin to the market, they had good intention. They want us to get rid of you no know, penicillinase producing staphylococcus aureus. No, that, that was intention. Unfortunately, it is now clinically useless. But the trouble caused by AIDS has remained a big topic in medical field. Why that? MRSA is now found in hospitals and even in healthy people. A recap here. Originally, infections caused by staph aureus could be treated with penicillin, meaning penicillin sensitive. Even as we speak, there is still the likelihood of finding some staph aureus that will be sensitive to methicillin. We call it methicillin sensitive staphylococcus aureus. It depends on what your you know, microscopic culture and sensitivity will bring up. Later, the bacteria became resistant to penicillin. So penicillin resistant. Then methicillin was synthesized to handle the trouble of penicillin resistance. Then later, salvorous became resistant to the same new agent called methicillin. Hence, we are done with methicillin resistance staphylococcus aureus. MRSA is also called a superbug. It is a strain of bacteria, precisely a strain of staphylococcus aureus. The very stubborn strain that is more difficult to treat than other staphylococcus aureus strains with common antibiotics and is mostly resistant to fluoroquinolones and cephalosporins. Let's quickly check you know, the genetic war and see if we can find out what has happened here. There's a gene responsible for this trouble, and the gene is this, found in a gene case that encodes an alter penicillin binding protein 2A, meaning PBB2A variant. That will be found in methicillin and other beta lesam antibiotics, and it is located on Staphylococca chromosome cases. The PBP2A is a different transpeptidase that's already altered. That is why you know, the name is a bit different because it's a variant. It has been altered. Ordinarily, the PBP, that is penicillin binding protein with transpeptidase, will succumb to beta lactam antibiotics. But with the help of this gene, the mutation has occurred and there's a variant of the penicillin binding proteins that will not succumb to beta lactam antibiotics. That is how bacteria got out of hand here. Yeah. That is how Staphylococcus got out of hand. Then the, the, the mutated gene with the altered PBP2A will continue with peptoglycan cross-linking. Remember I said earlier that cross-linking will be inhibited. No, it will continue here. Then that will keep the cell wall intact. It's like tornado struck, the wall of the building is suspended to not be swept away, but miraculously, you know, some people have been hiding somewhere, you know, trying to put another layer entirely. So you are no longer completely exposed to the atmosphere, to the flood and you know, the strong wind and everything. The same thing has happened to bacteria here. No longer completely exposed to water, and the pressure around, so they're no longer dying. They're becoming, the, the antibodies have become less effective because you no know, alternative pathway has been created, a variant has been created of 
penicillin binding protein. There are two types of MRSA. Is that a hospital or healthcare associated MRSA? In, in that case, it's tagged as bloodstream infections. But I'm not going to mix this point to say that we just take it just like that. No. It could be community you know, associated and still be bloodstream infection. Now it could be hospital associated and still be you know skin and soft tissue infection. So it could be you know either way, but majorly the hospital associated MRSA will be bloodstream infectious and reasons are not far fetched, right? It will be from contaminated devices or through certain procedures, mostly invasive procedures to surgeries, IV lines, central venous catheterization, many tubes, many probes, implantable devices, or even sometimes artificial joints and the list goes up. But like I said, majorly it will be bloodstream infections, but may also be you know, skin and soft tissue infections. Community associated MRSA will be majorly skin and soft tissue infections, but maybe bloodstream too. Like you're gonna find from uncles that is boys that will spread from skin to skin. The two can cross paths as per location. And someone will ask me, how about that? HA MRSA can be discharged into the community. Mm -hmm. I'm going to call it community associated. What if community associated MRSA is admitted into the hospital or healthcare facility? Here is the link between the two. This is hospital or healthcare facility associated MRSA. And this is community associated MRSA. When you discharge hospital associated to the community, what is happening? It's already in the community, right? When you admit the community, you know, MRSA positive patient to the hospital, then what is happening? So that's why I've said the two, you know, will be crossing paths. Okay. Certain definitions must be fully defined here for medical legal reasons and for correct record to be kept. Okay. Healthcare associated or hospital associated methicillin resistant staphylococcus aureus could be nosocomial infection, right? No argument about that. But we cannot call that the diagnosis unless the patient has been admitted into the hospital and has to remain in the hospital for at least 48 hours or more. Why that? Let me explain further. Once somebody is admitted and there's that suspicion or there's outbreak around and the swab is taken, the result must come back negative within the first 24 hours you know, of hospital admission. If the result within the first 24 hours of admission is positive for MRSA, then the hospital is not liable, meaning the patient has brought the MRSA from the community or wherever he or she has been, you know, transferred from. I hope my explanation is pretty clear. The hospital cannot be liable for MRSA and whatever consequences could not be sued because it's not hospital acquired until the patient has been admitted into the hospital and remain there for at least 48 hours or beyond.
Within the first 24 hours, swab must be taken and the result must be negative. If the result is positive within 24 hours of admission, that is not hospital associated. That has come from outside. So after hospitalization in anyone without such before, then the individual is now having it, then it is hospital associated. It can be acquired during surgery, and then the individual will not even know, and then be discharged to the community. So, hospital acquired MRSA can present with severe skin and soft tissue infections. Like I said earlier, that the fact that they call one bloodstream infections, the other one SS, you know. Uh, TI doesn't mean is that rigid. No. Hospital ashida could be soft you know, tissue and skin infections, could be bloodstream infections, can lead to pneumonia, can then lead to multidrug resistant infections. Now, risk factors for hospital ashita MRS or nosocomia infection. Indiscriminate antibiotics use, well, we'll talk more about that in a bit. Protracted hospital stay, that is long stay in the hospital. Then admission into intensive care units, either the adults or operatic intensive care unit. Hemodialysis or indwelling catheter. Still on the risk factors for nosocomial infections, it could be a result of surgery or someone that is being given intravenous drug, or someone is IVDU from outside, mm -hmm. intravenous drug user from the community, okay, and then admitted into the hospital. Then it could be as a result of immune state that has been compromised in HIV, in cancer, or cancer that is on chemotherapy or radiotherapy, Anyone on disease modified anti rheumatic drugs, patient on long steroid, organ transplantation, then the presence of others with MRSA in that hospital or that ward or that particular section of the hospital. Long term care stay and MRSA colonization. All this will serve as risk factors for hospital-associated MRSA. Now, the community-associated MRSA. Let's go through the risk factors here. And I'll do that very quickly. But the surprise is that there may be no risk factor or factors. Then, it could be as a result of accidents, lacerations, bruises, bites from animals, tattoos, other risk factors for community associated MRSA will be injections, IVDU, upper respiratory tract versions, particularly sneezing, sports injuries or sharing equipment, sharing needles, razors, blades, nail cutters, and the list goes on. Possible outbreak places, that is the places that you can find the outbreak of medicine resistance to areas in the community will include prison or correctional centers, barracks for military, police officers, group homes, daycare centers. Now you understand what now is there? Avi drug users, sport teams. Besides, where we can pick this horrible bacteria. And it can be there for as long as two years. Will be the skin, the nostrils. When your nostrils, the upper upper part is swabbed for you know microscopic culture and sensitivity, they are doing that to pick you no know, MRSA. The throat difference, the perineum or the groin, and then gastrointestinal tract. In infants, it could be found now. You even when the skin is intact. Check the eyes of infants, 
the Azula, the Perinum, and Umblicos. All these places could be colonized in infants. Other places will include one size or decubital ulcers for those that are bedridden. Catheter size, the sputum, the stool, urine, and of course, you know, urinary tract generally, and perineum, and you no, know, you understand that, right? Types of infections could be boiled, could be soft tissue infections, sepsis. Remember, the other time I told you that the fact that it is from community doesn't limit it to skin and soft tissue infections only. Now we could find sepsis even in community associated. Infective endocarditis from the community, necrotizing pneumonia, osteomyelitis, and urinary tract infections. This could be the you know, trouble that the individual present with. Let's look at the possible characteristics of the community associated MRSA. It is expected that it is not acquired in the hospital or healthcare facility, but that may not be the case. The individual could have even acquired it from the hospital and he or she has been discharged to the community. Mostly, community associated will be found in healthy individuals particularly younger age group. And mostly we are going to be dealing with soft you know, skin or soft tissue and skin infections. They are likely going to be sensitive to non-beta latam antibiotics like vancomycin or daptomycin. They may be resistant to beta lactams like macrolides, tetracyclines and fluoroquinolones. Here, there's a separate representation on fluoroquinolones. You can click on this link to take you there. It can be resistant to mopirocin or clindamycin. I also have a separate representation on clindamycin. You can click on this link to get there. Transmission. I know this is going to be pretty important to anyone, right? You want to run away from it, okay? It could be if it is in the hospital, it could be from nurses, doctors, you know, aid care aid, anybody, you know, aid care facilities, hospital staff. Could be as a result of surgery or the procedures, as a result of contaminated devices and surfaces, vomitors from a colonized or infected person or persons, sneezing or skin to skin contact. Colonization. Colonized people may be healthy. They may be healthy members of staff, and colonized people may be someone that's already sick. But either healthy or sick, they will serve as reservoirs, and they will help in transmitting these to others. They can remain as carriers for almost four years. Treatment. Mostly and prickly. Why that? We just treat based on the knowledge of the common trouble around and the agent that will think that you no know, bacteria will be susceptible to. But the most appropriate treatment should be when the result of MCS is out. Then we use the specific agent that that particular strain of bacteria will be susceptible to or sensitive to. When there is bar, we have to have incision and draining. As a matter of fact, this is a rule in medicine that anywhere there is abscess, there must be incision and draining. In cellulitis, we use intravenous antibiotics. If you are sure, of the nidus or the source of the MRSA, then get rid of it. Institute prevention protocol quickly will go into full preventive measures in a bit. Limit the spread, embark on treatment instantly.
Now, empirical treatment will include prioral antibiotics only if we are dealing with mild cases or we are dealing with localized cases and there's no systemic infection and no bloodstream infection. We can choose if we want to give prioral antibiotics under these mild cases, no systemic infection, then we can use Cetra. This is, that is called trimorsozole. This is the link to the full presentation on cordimorsozole. We can use linezole, reserve antibiotics, that works as both antibiotics and antidepressant. This link will take you to the full presentation on linezole. Click on my screen, then click on this link. Delafloxacin, a member of Lorquinolones, can click on this link. But in soft, severe soft uh, tissue or skin infection, don't use fluoroquinolones. Still, empirically, you will choose parenteral antibiotics. When we are faced, that means we will not give antibiotics by aura when we are faced with systemic infection, extensive sub tissue infection, cellulitis, or the case that is rapidly progressing. In fact, that is one of the clues to know you are dealing with cellulitis, right? Another situation when we will go for non power agent is if you have use power agent for more than 72 hours and there's no improvement then we'll go we we'll change to non power then in immunocompromised patients non power in anyone with prosthetic device close to the site of infection we we'll go for non power there are so many good agents to choose from but remember this is just what I'm familiar with. It depends on what is obtainable in your jurisdiction and what the microscopic commercial sensitivity test will bring out as sensitive agent or agent that the bacteria will be susceptible to. So Vanco, Dafto, Delafloxacin, Linezoli, and Telamvacin, particularly in severe skin, soft tissue infections and of course another group member is the above vaccine when we are using antibiotics we have to review the clinical state within 24 to 48 hours okay and we will not do this alone we'll do that with the help of infectious disease specialists okay if there's no improvement in 72 hours, then it is likely that the antibiotics or antibiotics is or are not working. Or we can take a guess. We are dealing with MRSA. Then we will call for blood culture or polymerase chain reaction. Someone will ask, why wouldn't you start that initially? Remember, I'm saying empirically, right? So you get out of the empirical treatment and go for definitive treatment by insisting on MCS. When there's an outbreak, first thing first, there must be that communication. The floor manager must pass the info to all members of staff, all doctors, particularly the infectious disease experts must be informed. Why that? When doctors are transferring patients to the unit without break or taking patients from the unit, that info must flow along. All technicians, whether certain procedures are invasive, they must know that the patient they are dealing with is coming from a unit without break of MRSA. Protocol to be put in place with a written order. Whether verbal order may not go wrong. Some will change shift, and the information may not be passed across. People can inadvertently forget. So when there is a written protocol, anyone that resumes duty will say. 
If that patient must be transferred to another unit or hospital, the new unit or hospital must be informed that we are transferring so 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 and so from our unit, but right now we have an outbreak of MRSA. EMS that will transfer this patient are human beings, right? They must be informed. In fact, when they are informed, they will serve as a big disseminator of the information to the new center they will be taking the new and the patient too. Still on actions needed when there's outbreak. Inform infectious disease specialist, like I've said, if one patient is in a room with MRSA positive, then any staff that will enter that room must have personal protective equipment. The gloves, the gown, the glasses. All patients in that room must be screened. There must be separate vital signs machine assigned to that very patient. We have to isolate all gadgets that that patient will be using. We have to call to other food, not filling the menu form to other food. So the affected person will make phone call to the kitchen or anywhere the food will come from, not filling the form. Because when the form is filled, the pen, or pencil used, the form already filled will be transferred you know, from one person to the other and to the food you know, center, the kitchen or wherever. Commode will be better for bedside use. Still, in the face of outbreak, if one patient in a room is MRA positive, we must put a sign at the door. This is not to discriminate against the patient, it's to protect the rest of people, including the loved ones of the said patient. We must place a sign by the curtain. If we are dealing with MRSA in a room where the patient there are sharing that room. You know, if that is the case, they will have curtain, right? When you want to take vital signs, you want to do examination and so on. So this time around, that curtain must remain permanently, not only when we need to do vital signs or anything, must remain permanently and a sign must be there. Prevent too many visitors at a time. And the visitors that will even visit must have PPE while visiting. A certain room, a separate room, brother, will be better. Is that not a blessing in disguise, eh? That should be a blessing in disguise, right? Mm -hmm. If we must do all those stuff above, that is everything I've said on the last five or six minutes, what will you do if a whole unit is down with about 10 patients with MRSA? Please supply your answer or answers at the comment section. Now, prevention. Charity begins at home, so they say, but it doesn't end there. So, we went back on antibiotic stewardship. Here, I'm not teaching anybody. I'm just explaining what should be done to prevent MRSA. So, physicians should ask, now, each person should answer these questions privately. Am I prescribing fluoroquinolones indiscriminately? Is it okay to give that antibiotics? Is the antibiotics that are prescribed not excessive? Is that an appropriate or the correct dose to prescribe? Why the antibiotic in suspected viral illness without secondary bacterial infection or without any superimposed bacterial infection? Why am I giving antibiotics in viral illness? Am I doing that to please that patient? Because the patient has told me that Dr. Susoso the other time when I had this same problem, 
give me any viruses? Or do I have the fear that if I don't prescribe any viruses right now, this patient will get out of my presence, walk to another clinic, and the other doctor will prescribe it? Still on prevention, we will categorize patients based on the level of risk, you no, know, of having MRSA. The high risk patients will be the following. Anyone already with the history of MRSA, positive history of MRSA before now, that is high risk. Anyone who had received antibiotics in the last three months, hospitalized in the last one year, someone already with skin and soft tissue infection on admission, admitted into intensive care units, someone that is immunocompromised, being transferred from long-term care facilities or on hemodialysis. All these attack grace and high-risk patients for MRSA. Still on prevention. Remember, we must give honor to whom it is due, right? This is the territory of the infectious disease specialists, so we must involve them. Okay? It is all about active surveillance. Appropriate antibiotics should be used, accurate diagnosis should be embarked upon, correct treatment to eradicate MRSA must be our goal. Still on prevention, now screening. We cannot be screening everybody, right? But if we are working in a particular unit, we will embark on screening, particularly for the newly admitted patients. And let's go through the list, oncology unit. Why that? The cancer itself, the chemotherapy, the radiotherapy, all different medications they are taking can suppress the immunity. Bone marrow could be down, with neutropenia at the same time. This is a serious issue. They cannot joke with any bacteria. In fact, any infection whatsoever. So they will screen. Intensive care unit to screen all new admissions. Pediatric intensive care unit will do the same. If there's hospital admission recently, now, coming to our hospital today, we will screen. Positive history of travel to places known to have outbreak of MRSA or a particular facility within the community with the history of MRSA will be screened right now. A patient being transferred to you know, another new unit from a unit with MRSA, the new unit should screen. Positive history of contact, then we're going to screen you right now. IV drug users should be screened. Patients from correctional centers that is prison or barracks should be screened. Positive past medical history of MRSA in this very patient, then we'll swab you now the anterior nerves, now main nostrils will swab the perineum, or you call it groin, right now, for MRSA. Then, part of the prevention is to prevent the spread. Prevent contact or decrease the degree of contact by wearing gloves, glasses, and gown. And then we have to identify the source and control the cell. Decolonization. Cultures of the anterior nerves, pharynx, and so on will let us know if MRSA is present. Then chlorhexidine could be used as mouthwash and could be used for bathing. Nesamopyrosine could be used. Some we embark on intensive decolonization by using three medications at once. Each is strong on its own. Revampine, double strain septra, that is called remosazole, and doxycycline combined for 
decolonization. In conclusion, we've gone through the origin of Peninsula. We've examined the journey how we arrive at methicillin resistance of the cucosaurus. Picham that not brought methicillin to the market in 1959 had good intention. But unfortunately, as pharmaceutical world was working harder to deal with bacteria, Staphylococcus aureus no walked no extra mile too to distort the way the beta latam ring has been cleaned. They developed the enzyme that would destroy the beta latam ring. Then a variant of penicillin binding protein was created. Then they were able to circumvent the activity of the penicillin. And then we ran into methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus just, just two years after methicillin was introduced to the mark. And since then, we are still dealing with the toll. So, offering truths in war between bacteria and antibiotic war are presented. This very, what well, the six minutes presentation on methicillin resistance, Staphylococcus aureus. Prevention, they say, is cheaper than cure. Thanks for listening. Please remember to share this on your platform with all your friends worldwide. Whether it is a worldwide problem. Thank you.